Jeff, thank you for uh, putting the conference together. Thank you for putting this panel together. I think it's really important that we have a discussion about it together. Uh, and uh, and uh, I don't know that uh, anyone's been more supportive of every pathway to get money out of politics than we have at the Young Turks. Uh, we've supported uh, almost every group in the field, American Promise, Represent Us. Uh, you name it, we've supported them. We've supported every pathway, legislation, ballot measures, uh, amendment through Congress and an amendment through the states. Uh, and we call for unity, uh, and the group that I started, Wolf Pack, calls for unity. In fact, there's a letter out now, wolf packcom slash unity, uh, to uh, make sure that everyone in the movement is fighting together instead of against each other. Uh, I think that most people here would agree with that. Unfortunately, that's not always the case, as you'll see uh, in this uh, discussion. So uh, the one area, uh, where we do have disagreement is the convention. Uh, so it's easy to say, let's do legislation. And I support every attempt at legislation. In this Congress, in this Congress, you're going to get legislation. OK. Then you're going to get 67 senators to call for an amendment. Does anyone, anyone believe that's possible? So, all right, Ben, God bless your heart. In okay. this, in this <laughs> all right. or the next one? <laughs> all right, let the record note that three Americans raise their hands. <laughs> um, so uh, for uh, our friends who believe a convention uh, is too risky, I, I'd like to s state for the record what I think almost every progressive in the country knows. We are not winning. We're, it's not 2114 to use a base, uh, football analogy, it's 49 nothing. We're getting slaughtered. Now, I remember the first discussion I had in this case with Common Cause, uh, uh, and I asked, okay, what is the alternative if you're not gonna go to the states? And it was uh, two things. One was demographic changes. I don't know if that takes two or three decades. I don't know how many decades that takes. The other one was the Supreme Court. How's that working out? Um, so that is, in my opinion, and I think the opinion shared by a lot, but we'll have the discussion, not a very viable path, and it can be overturned by the next Supreme Court. There is only one thing that cannot be overturned. That is a constitutional amendment. And unfortunately, there is only one pathway right now to get that constitutional amendment, and that is to go to the states. Now, I have great news for you. At the state level, the corruption is not anywhere near the uh, level it is at the national. So in the national level, the corruption is nearly complete. I would argue for the Republican Party, it is at least 98%. Unfortunately, for the Democratic Party, you could argue over percentages, but 80% is not a bad figure. So uh, it is nearly impossible to get them who are wedded to money in politics, who got their power through that money in politics, who won in this corrupt system to say, oh yeah, golly gee, I guess you're right, I'll change that system. But at the state level, they do not have national power and they are more responsive to their voters. And because they represent smaller and smaller number of voters. And those voters are overwhelmingly on our side, both Democratic and Republican voters. They are 93% uh, believe that politicians represent their donors and not their voters. They believe that unfortunately our democracy has become completely corrupted. So um, to uh, tackle the convention issue as quickly as I can, obviously that's why I think strategically it is absolutely necessary. Uh, and then of course people say, well, there are risks. If you're winning and you're up 28 nothing, Man, don't take any risks. Run up the middle, get your yard and a half, and punt, right? But uh, what, since we began that conversation, not just with Common Cause, but with everybody and all the different groups, what has happened? We have lost 1,000 seats at the state level, making it much harder. We've lost the House of Representatives, we've lost the Senate, and we lost the presidency to Donald Trump. Every day that we don't do something is a day we fall further behind. While people tell us it's too risky to act, <laughs> it is far, far riskier not to act in every possible way to get to that amendment. And uh, 
in, in terms of those so-called risks, right now they say, well, what if there's an uh, unlimited uh, convention? Well, there, there are enough calls for an unlimited convention right now. So we'll get into the specifics of that as we, as we go here. Uh, and they have not done it. There are enough calls to call for a convention right now. They have not done it. So it is not true that you could have an unlimited convention. It's just not. Uh, and everything that a convention does is to propose an amendment. That is also inarguable. You can read Article 5 for yourself. Article 5 says that, it can, uh, that uh, whatever is proposed, either through Congress or a convention, must be ratified by three quarters of the states. It is one of the hardest constitutions in the world to amend. You must get three quarters of the states to ratify. Lucky for us, we represent the only issue in the country that three quarters of the states actually agree to, which is that money in politics has corrupted and nearly destroyed our democracy. Let's take it to the voters at the state level, and that is our pathway to victory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Cenk. And I, just so um, you know, no one thinks American promise is naive. Um, I'm always happy to be the only one in the room to raise a hand if I think it's right. Um, and and Ben Gubitz had his hand up there too. And I want to say why. Uh, we don't think there's 67 senators in the Congress right now who are going to do this. There are 290 members in the House. But we do believe in the American people, and we believe in you, and we, uh, and, our, and, and us, in our ability to make Congress do what it may not want to do now, but will be forced to do if we build this movement strong enough. And I just want to give a little history before I turn it to Vicky to um, address uh, the concerns that cause her to oppose the use of a convention call. But I guarantee you, the women who went to Tennessee who, to win ratification of the 19th Amendment that Bill Moyers described a few minutes ago uh, did not have a strategy in you know 10 years before that happened. Oh, let's just go and ask the all-male unelected Senate to have two-thirds of them give us the right to vote. And oh, here's another idea. While we're there, let's ask that two-thirds of the unelected Senate to do another amendment that says we're going to elect senators. That would have been crazy. But if I were there then, I would raise my hand and say, damn right, because that's correct. It's what we have to do. And it's what we're going to do now. And just like us now, they had people who said, we got to have a convention. The Senate and Congress are never going to do it. And they had people saying, are you kidding me? A convention is a really bad idea. So the position of American Promise the view, the, th the theory, is we are in a system and we need everybody doing what they think is the right thing to move this forward. And that's what we believe in and that's what we believe is gonna cause every, um, just like all other amendments, 27 amendments, every one of them came out two thirds of Congress ratified by three quarters of the states. And it wasn't because they stood down on other strategies, it's that's the outcome and that's what the outcome we believe in. So. That's why we have American Promise members on both sides of this argument and are quite comfortable with that. It's not up to us to say which, what you have to believe. It's up to us to help you get the information you need so you can move this forward. And Vicki Harrison has been uh, in this for some years and we have moved it forward in New Mexico um, and without a convention call. And you have, uh, in Common Cause, has opposed convention calls and sought to stop them in favor of a straight congressional strategy on the amendment. Could you tell us why that is, what your concerns are? Sure, how about the con side of the con con? <laughs> um, I'm gonna turn that into my new tagline. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, as uh, Jeff says, I'm with Common Cause New Mexico. I've been the ED out there for about six and a half years. And in 2012, we became the second state to ask Congress to do something about Citizens United. We got tired of them not doing anything, so we did it again this year. And I can understand the concerns 
that people say, why would you think that Congress would do anything? Why would you think this Congress would do anything? And I, quite frankly, as somebody who does work in the states, would say the same thing about state legislatures. Why would we expect them to do anything? I mean, Citizens United, in that decision, there was a secondary eight to one decision that said, but of course you'll have disclosure. I mean, yeah, we'll just blow the doors off money, but of course we'll know where it came from. Talk to those of us in the states that don't have good disclosure laws, who've been fighting for now eight years to get that disclosure that everybody expected. So if we can't get state legislators to even agree to disclose where the money comes from, it becomes very difficult to get them to say, but we're gonna get rid of all that money. And so, you know, yes, the threat of a runaway convention is part of it, but that's just one piece of our concern around an Article V convention. Um, all of what the pro side says, we feel like are exactly the arguments on the anti side as well. Um, special interest. Uh, we've got, you know, more than 30 of our states that are run by Republican legislatures and Republican governors. And I work a lot with Republicans in New Mexico and they want disclosure. I mean, my polling every year shows that 90% of the Republican people in New Mexico want disclosure. But that doesn't translate to the state legislature. And I wish that I had the same attitude that, you know, that Jenk has about the state legislatures, that they're smaller and they represent people who are there that's not my experience as an advocate for 25 years in New Mexico. And that we would have passed a disclosure bill that five years ago I passed unanimously through the Senate four times and still isn't law. And so I think that you know the special interests that run these states as well as Congress is part of our concern. Um, we're concerned about what if there's a disagreement at the convention? Who writes the rules? Um, let's say they come up with an amendment. What court is in charge of even looking at it? You know, we talk about, you know, if we're going to combine amendments or not. I'm telling you, on the ground in New Mexico, Democrat legislators who want a convention on Citizens United will vote for a convention of states and tell you, I'm hoping we can combine them. And the same thing happens on the other side. Now, and if that's not going to happen, does that mean that every single convention application has to be exactly the same? Because I don't know about y'all, but working in New Mexico, you can introduce something. It's never going to look the way you introduced it by the time you finish it. This is democracy, and state legislators love to dicker around in democracy. They think they know more than anybody else. And so I think there's a variety of reasons. I mean, we've written a report called The Dangerous Path. Anybody can go on our website and read all of the reasons. And I just want to close by saying for this net for now, is you know, you'll hear a lot about common cause opposing this. And it's not just common cause. Um, we put together a letter last year and over 250 organizations signed it. In fact, in New Mexico, to fight convention applications, I had my partners, all of my union partners and my immigrants' rights partners who came to me and asked me for my help in defeating it. So you may hear a lot about common cause, but there's not just common cause. We've got everybody from NARAL to Scalia saying that's a bad idea. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Vicki. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. And so let's bring Ken Chesteg into the conversation. We're very glad to have a law professor who's looked into some of the legal issues around this. This isn't something that comes up every day, of course, in American law or life. Uh, but Ken, what have you found? Why are you comfortable with the convention strategy? Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Vicki and Jenk. Um, look forward to hearing from everybody. Um, so about a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, we tried to get this through the Wyoming legislature without success. So uh, three of us, uh, Shelby Shadwell and Lynn Morrison, and I saw them both here in the room, and, and me and a few others, um, decided that we would try and put this on the ballot. And the first question that we encountered was, what are we putting on the ballot? Are we going to ask pretty please, Mr. Congress, can you do this for us? or are we going to go all the way and ask for um, actual voters to weigh in and say, yes, uh, we want a convention of states because we don't think Congress is gonna do it. 
So, and we'd heard all the stories, all the horror stories about how a, con a convention can run away and there's no rules, so they'll make up the rules and they can change the, amen change the amendment process and everything, all those, I heard all those things. Um, so the first thing we did was do some research uh, to find out, are they true? Um, what are the risks? Because we, we knew this was gonna be a critical decision before we decided to go forward with the petition. Which way do we go? Uh, so we did the research and discovered um, a couple of interesting things. First of all, that the uh, fear of a convention is bipartisan, cross left and right, both groups on the left and the right, and Vicky's absolutely right, there's a number of groups on the left, including Common Cause, that oppose it. There's groups on the right that oppose it, including ALEC. Uh, ALEC is opposed to this, so it's kind of a strange bedfellow situation. Um, but when I did dug into it, it, we finally concluded that the position against the amendment, or against the, the convention call, uh, is wrong for three very important reasons. Uh, number one, it's historically, factually wrong. The, the, the claims about a, the, the, uh, the 1787 convention running away is factually incorrect. That is not true. Um, but also, we felt that, that these r arguments were legally inaccurate, which I'll get to in a second. But also, and this is the key one for us, strategically unwise. And Jenk has already uh, outlined some of the reasons why we think it's strategically unwise. So let me just start first by talking about why I think it's historically wrong. Um, the, the argument is that um, the only convention we ever had was a runaway convention, uh, that the Articles of Confederation were, the uh, Congress called a convention of states and to, to amend the articles, and instead the convention ran away, and it uh, proposed a whole new con constitution, constitution, which was a runaway convention, uh, and that's two points. Number one, um, if that's true, then the constitution is invalid. Why are you supporting it, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that didn't make sense, but more importantly, it's factually not true. Con the Continental Congress did not call that convention in 1787. Here's what actually happened. In 1786, Virginia, there, so the Articles of Confederation were not working. Um, there was all kinds of problems. Most, in, in, most of, of the problems in, involved commerce between the states. They were taxing each other and there was a lot of problems with interstate commerce. Um, so there was a convention uh, called by the state of Virginia, uh, and only five states showed up, um, but they all agreed that there are problems with the Articles of Confederation, and we think we need a, a much wider con uh, convention involving all the states, uh, and more, dealing more, with more than just the commerce problems, there's a lot of other problems with the Articles that need to be fixed. So Virginia called for a convention to meet in Philadelphia in 1787. Six other six states joined that, uh, and ultimately Congress said, "If you want to, go ahead." Uh, but Congress did not call it. It was actually called by the states. So it, the process it was, and, and actually Congress at that time could not have possibly called for a convention of states because the Articles of Confederation did not include that power. Did not say that this is a way you can do this. So they had to step outside of the Articles of Confederation uh, and called, the states themselves called this. They met in, in, in Philadelphia, and the call was not make some minor changes to the Articles. The call was, we, we need a general convention. If you re I, I read, last night I, I read the uh, report from the Annapolis Convention in 1786 uh, that said we want a general convention to, to discuss everything. So the states called for a general convention. How can you run away from that? That gives the state, the convention, the power to propose whatever it wanted to propose, and it proposed a new, a new constitution. It was not running away from its power, it was exercising the power given to it by the states which called for this general convention. So that's the first point. The, the first convention was not a runaway convention. It was called by the states independent of the articles. So factually, that, that point is in, absolutely incorrect. It's legally incorrect. I think um, the, 
Uh, the fact that the Constitution doesn't, uh, that the current Constitution, Article 5, does not have rules for how a convention should run has been taken by those who oppose the convention to mean, there, therefore, there are no rules and the convention can do whatever it wants. That's the argument you hear all the time. In fact, all that means is the constitutions generally don't have those kinds of detailed r rules. Uh, there's lots of stuff. The, the constitution states, states general principles, broad principles, and um, then leaves it to other bodies that it creates to, f to come up with the rules. So the courts come up with rules, Congress writes rules, or the administrative branch writes rules. Uh, the Constitution is not a rule-making a, a rule thing, so it's not surprising to me that Article 5 doesn't have specific rules for our convention. You need to find other sources of rules, and there are several of them. Uh, the Due Process Clause is one that we need to honor people's expectations. Um, but the biggest one to me is simple common law, the common law of agency. Now, I'm a law professor, and I can tell you um, with some authority, I think, that this is a typical first-year law school concept. Uh, when a principal says, I want to appoint somebody as my agent to do something, that agent has, one, has only the power given to it by the principal. So if the state says, I appoint this delegate, and we call them delegates, they are receiving power from a higher authority, the state, I appoint my, this delegate to do one thing, write an amendment on this issue. It doesn't have, that agent does not have the right to do anything more than that one thing. So legally, I think the, the, it's impossible for a convention, it's legally impossible. We're asking the wrong question. We ask, how can we stop the convention from running away? The actual question is, what gives it the right to do that in the first place? How could it possibly have the right to do something that's not been authorized to do? And finally, I'll close with this, um, and because Jenks already talked about strategically unwise, uh, I think strategically, uh, this is the only tool we have that has a chance of success. Why deprive ourselves of that one tool that we think has a chance for success? Uh, and a final point, um, there are those, and Alec actually does not want a runaway convention, but there are some on the right who say, if we get a convention, we're gonna do whatever we want. Uh, why do we wanna give them aid and comfort? If we're standing here saying a convention can run away, then uh, the, the, the convention call that's closest to getting this done is a, uh, a right wing side, uh, the balanced budget amendment, they're close. And if they get the convention, they can say, hey look, all the people on the left say it can run away, let's do it. Let's run away, they say we can. Strategically, it's not smart to make that argument. Uh, I don't think it's possible for a, con a convention to run away it's highly unlikely, uh, and I therefore, we made the choice at Wyoming Promise to go for the Convention of States, and uh, let's hope it, we get it. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you, Ken. Uh, Craig Clevidence has given a lot of thought to this, to different amendments. I encourage you to check out renewdemocracy.org, right? And, um, We've been uh, grateful to him for joining this panel all the way from Montana. And let me ask you, Craig, where do you come out? Are you satisfied that uh, Jenk and Ken have answered all the issues on this question? Well, certainly not. Um, there are two immutable facts that fuel this debate. Certainly it is the case that um, without some type of external pressure, uh, look at the, what happened in the historical perspective uh, uh, example of the uh, 17th Amendment. That's when um, we ratified uh, the provision that uh, senators would be elected directly by individuals instead of being appointed by the House of Representatives. Um, the, uh, uh, without a nearly successful, and in fact some historians say it was actually successful, that there were the adequate number of calls, without the uh, pressure of a constitutional uh, convention uh, threat, the Senate would have never ratified that bill. We would not have direct election of senators without that. That's certainly the case. 
but it is also certainly the case that Article 5 is short and sweet. It certainly also does not define how this, the convention would uh, take place in, in any real fashion. There are three aspects that are concerning. First off is the call. Um, that's the, the request to Congress to initiate the con Constitutional Convention. Uh, what uh, is the uh, situation for what would be con uh, considered a valid de determined call? There are, no there are no established rules for that. So does the call have to be identical? Does each call have to be the same? Uh, undoubtedly, if all calls are not the same, the calls will be questioned. They'll be uh, contested, and if they're contested, they'll march up to the uh, Supreme Court. Does anyone here think the Supreme Court will be interested in enabling us to change the Constitution? I'm certain not. Um, there, of course, is also the, call, the concern about the content, um, the subject matter of the convention. When we talk about a runaway convention, what that means is there's, we're just putting in subject matter, we're asking questions that were not already ratified by the states in the process, not ratified, but approved by the states in the process to secure ratification. So that it simply means that we're inserting subject matter that wasn't in part, the part of the call. There are no rules that govern that. So to say we can't have a runaway quote unquote convention is really uh, just anyone's conjecture without any type of rules. So uh, we have a situation where uncertainty reigns on both sides. It's uncertainty on the side of um, the uh, uh, folks that are opposed to a convention process. What will happen when we call the convention? Will we, uh, is there a possibility that we would enable uh, questions that have not been sent through the process of uh, 34 states uh, to consider? That's an, it's an entire possibility. But historically, if you look at um, uh, the past, we certainly can see that the, the, we have not had a constitutional convention in the past since uh, the 1780s. Uh, in the social sciences, we learn that the most likely thing to happen tomorrow is what happened today. The most likely thing to happen today is what happened in the past. If we've not had a constitutional convention in the past, it seems like that's relatively highly unlikely that we're going to be able to perfect that. If we don't perfect that, how is it that we're going to move our issue forward adequately and win the support that we need if we don't have the pressure from a constitutional convention type of a process as well as uh, attempting to secure legislation? So both things are important. We, we, seem, we seem to be having a debate here about something that we really don't need to have a debate about. And here's why. We can eliminate that uncertainty by initiating legislation that would control the process. Um, Edwin Meese, the uh, Attorney General for Ronald Reagan, commissioned a study by the Department of Justice. In that study, is about 60 page, <laughs> fairly lengthy tomb, It'll make your eyes water, even if you are a, uh, a, a, a constitutional professor. I've read it. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that, that Ken read, it was the end. I've posted on my website, and it's also on your Whova app, the, the document that I'm referring to. Uh, this is the Department of Justice. This is not my opinion, and probably I don't know of, of any other uh, legal authority that would prevail over the Department of Justice. And this is what they say in the end of their executive summary. This paper concludes by recognizing that there are inevitable uncertainties associated with any yet untried process. However, it is suggested that the adoption of the convention procedures legislation by the Congress would minimize greatly any remaining uncertainties associated with the convention method of amendment. So we have at hand a method of eliminating the uncertainty in the process, and yet no one on either side of this debate has initiated that. It's, un it's understandable that it would take a, a fair amount of work and it's kind of ancillary to anyone's process, so we have not developed that. 
but uh, it also is certainly the case that um, legislation has existed in the past. This is not a unicorn. This is not an imaginary creature. Uh, the uh, staunch liberal uh, Orrin Hatch from Utah <laughs> um, introduced legislation in the 1980s. That's also on my website. It's also on your Whova app. The uh, exact legislation that was introduced, and it would control the. It was introduced to control the call, limit the subject matter, and also make sure that the certification process by Congress would be effectual. In other words, once the uh, convention was done with its work, then the ratification would be sent by Congress to the, uh, uh, to the states. So that would eliminate any possibility of a, of a runaway convention or a convention that considered subject matter that was not introduced in the call. I think it's essential that we come together as a uh, movement, that we take up a drive for legislation that would solve the uncertainties so that we can not only use the uh, amendment, um, the standard uh, legislative uh, <clears throat> procedures, but that we can enable the Constitutional Convention procedures to be effective, both for us and for the future. Because understandably, having a perfected set of regulations would make a Constitutional Convention push politically feasible. Right now, you have to say that the feas feasibility of a uh, uh, constitutional convention amendment push is dubious. Uh, the uncertainty has, uh, as we, uh, and, and this is evident in the balanced budget amendment proposal, uh, they have come close a couple times and have states dropped off because they were concerned about the procedural uh, ramifications. Thank Jeff, I just yeah. want to pop in real quick before you move on, and I just want to question the fact that ALEC is opposed to a constitutional convention, because somebody just sent me a text with a Bill Moyers program where Bill is talking about how they love it. So I just wanted to clarify that. If I could respond to that quickly. Yeah, just a point of order, factual clarification, and then I, I know there's going to be some questions out here. And I want to make sure that you have a chance to answer some of those. So just factual correction, position of Alex, Alec. Yes. Um, so I, I was on the Alec website last night and found a lot of articles opposing the convention process. Um, and I know um, for a fact that Alec has proposed legislation in many states that say a limited convention, that, that delegates to a limited convention are limited to what they are called to do. We adopted that in Wyoming. So Wyoming uh, was a target state for many years for uh, ALEC to try and get on board with the balanced budget amendment. So it's a, you would think it's a, a pretty ripe uh, state for, the, for that pickup. Wyoming refused to do that for many years because of the fear of the convention call. Um, so uh, they, of, of the runaway convention. The runaway convention was their fear. So ALEC proposed model legislation which has been enacted by at least nine states that say a convention cannot run away, uh, that delegates to a convention uh, are limited to voting on what they want to vote, what, what the call is for, uh, and uh, if they fail to follow, if they, if they do try and run away, the delegates are removed from the delegation uh, they are replaced by other delegates, and they have committed a felony. So literally in Wyoming, if one of our delegates tried to run away, they can go to jail for five years. Alec proposed that legislation, and so, it was adopted in Wyoming and several others, at least nine states that I know of have adopted that. Okay. If you have a question about this process, because it's complicated, I and mean, what's interesting is, you know, Americans are fully capable of some pretty complex constitutional law discussions, and that's what we're about. And that's what we're having. But if you have a question, um, raise your hand in a moment. But I want to do one more round, give Jank a chance to weigh in. And he's got lots of notes I've been seeing, so I hope you digest them. And then I want to give Vicky a, a chance to um, just close out any other remaining um, concerns after hearing Jank's arguments on the other side. And then I want, if you have a question about the process or what people have said, We'll want to make sure we save time for that. So, Jen, go ahead. 
Right. Uh, there are a lot of things I want to address. I'm going to go real quick. Uh, first, I want to say there are good people on all sides here, and I know that they mean well, and if we had beers or tea or something, I'm sure we'd get along. Uh, but there are real-life consequences, so I want to get to that in a second. Look, uh, uh, first of all, I want to be clear. I support American Promise and every other group that tries to do it through Congress. Uh, and we've had people on the show to fight for that. In fact, I started a whole group called Justice Democrats to create enough momentum in Congress to be able to pursue that path as well. So, uh, and, and most importantly, that actually several of the panelists here have uh, described, a uh, call for a convention creates enormous pressure for Congress to act. In fact, more than half of our amendments have been because of pressure created by a convention, including the 17th Amendment, which I believe Craig said was an immutable fact, that how close we got to the convention, the 17th Amendment, forced Congress to go, yeah, yeah, I, I meant direct elections of senators. So that these two things help each other. They don't fight each other if you do both, but you must do both. Now, uh, I, I know that Vicky mentioned that they did a, a study called Dangerous Path, which I think is a great title, because it goes to the heart of the fear mongering in this. Oh my God, don't act, don't act. Whatever you do, do not do something. And she mentions 250 organizations. There's a lot of Poughkeepsie's and Rochester's in there. Let's just, uh, from the same organizations. But anyway, but most importantly, and this is important, uh, is unions. So yeah, a lot of the unions do, and I've had conversations with them, and I think they are beginning to change on that. But you have to remember, the unions also do money in politics. They put a lot of money into politics. So it's not that they're particularly worried about a convention as much as they're worried about getting money out of politics. And I think all of us here agree that we must get money out of politics. And what I'm trying to convince our union brothers and sisters is you're on the end of a perpetual losing battle. They'll always have more money than you. Please think long term, not short term. So uh, now um, I've got to address some of the things that we say. Rules. Uh, there's not enough rules. But uh, Ken is exactly right. The Constitution is not supposed to set out the Roberts rules of orders of anything, let alone a convention. But to say that there are no rules and it'll be just mayhem is not true. We've had hundreds of state conventions. There are plenty of rules. We know exactly how it would proceed. Now, you could say, hey, well, look, you're not positive about some of those. I hear you, Craig. But my God, are we going to be frozen into inaction because you're not sure about Rule 17b3? So uh, we have to go forward and if, unless, and by the way, I totally support your call for clarification of rules. And in fact, we've gone and had meetings of Democrats and Republican legislators to try to sort out those rules because we are thinking ahead. And, and, but, and so God bless you on that fight. So great, let's do that together. But let us not say, okay, let's all pause before we figure out the rules. You know what's gonna motivate people to figure out the rules? If a convention is coming then they're gonna say, yes, my God, let's get the rules right. And, hold on, uh, and, and in, in terms of 1787, look, this is super important. Uh, the, uh, it was ratified, even 1787, the Constitutional Convention, that was not an Article V con convention because Article V did not exist at the time. That was, uh, the Constitution didn't exist at the time. An Article V Convention is different. It is limited by definition. Uh, and, but even so, the Constitutional Convention was ratified. In fact, Rhode Island and North Carolina were briefly foreign countries because they refused to ratify. So the ratification process is incredibly important. And the worst case scenario they have is a runaway convention that created the best document ever written. So if you trust the people, you will get to good results. And I have to say that when Vicky talks about state legislatures not always doing the right thing, that is unfortunately true. But the, in our experience, the number one group that affects state legislatures not to do this is common cause. They, I, look, a lot of you in the room, Maryland, Hawaii, New Mexico, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Common Cause blocked us and everyone. Massachusetts just happened. In Maryland, we had it. We had the House of Delegates. We had the Senate. We had more than enough senators that were co-sponsors. We were definitely going to pass. And Common Cause went to the state legislatures and said, don't do it, don't do it, dangerous path, don't do it. So you understand that it is not a theoretical debate. They have killed resolutions to get money out of politics all across the country. And they say, and Ricky explains why. She thinks it's too dangerous. It's a dangerous path. But it does actively fight to get money or to keep money in politics. 
the Koch brothers did, lost to us in New Jersey. Alec, Alec is, he's, Ken is right. Alec fought us in New Jersey and they lost. But they're no match for common cause. They have better lobbyists and they defeat us when the right wing can't because they, they have lobbyists that talk to Democratic legislators and scare the hell out of them, and it's just not true. Okay, so we need to, we need to be mindful of time, um, and I'm gonna give Vicki a chance to respond. As we said at the outset, it's no secret that Common Cause opposes this, and that they will oppose it when it comes up in the states. Um, that's what their position is, it's been very clear. So I wanna give Vicki a chance to say why that is, and and let's hear it. Sure, and again, you know, this idea that by opposing this one particular bill, we're, fi you know, we're fighting to keep money in politics is just simply ludicrous. If you wanna know what Common Cause does in the states, then first of all, email me and I'll send you a list of our wins in every single state on a variety of issues around money and politics. And I think that, you know, we can, you know, in an era, we are in an era of extreme gerrymandering. We are in an era of, you know, again, so much money in politics that the people who talk about money in politics can't even predict how much is going to be spent in the next year. I mean, it just explodes every single year. We are in a hyper partisan atmosphere. So, what I say is, why would we think that this atmosphere is gonna create anything that's good for our country? It's special interest on both sides of the aisle. And yes, we can hope that these things are gonna happen the way we think they might, but the truth of the matter is, is nobody up here really knows. And we have a, a really great attorney on our national governing board, and he's got a great quote about the CONCON. -con. He says, why set your house on fire and then pray the fire department shows up in time? Thank you. So I'll work backwards. Bruce, go ahead and question. Ah, to the moderator council. <laughs> you know better, Bruce. <laughs> Someone on the panel said that the only way is to go through the convention because we'll never get it through Congress. But we can elect a new Congress. And in fact, we have, a, in my view, have a better chance of doing that than going from the five. We only have five states right now. And we have to get to 34, and the ba balanced budget thing has been going on for years and years and years, and they still haven't gotten to 34. So what makes you think that we're going to get to 34 before we can elect a new Congress that will be much more amenable to this? Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to take a few, get some, make sure we get some in, and then I'll pull the questions out of it. And I'll just work backwards, and I'll get over here, too. So go ahead, sir, in the yellow. Yeah. Basically, I'm confused by the fact that if we have, whether it's a convention or the amendment process that we're following. If the amendment wording calls for multiple issues, and there are other amendments that are out there for a single issue, does that constitute, in your case, a call for the same thing? It, it, it's confusing to me. Okay, we're gonna clarify that in a second. Let's get a couple more in here. Yeah? Hi, um, my question is if we have any examples from other countries' <clears throat> constitutional processes, of the ways in which they've gone around amending their constitutions through a similar type of um, mechanism like a constitutional convention. Okay, we're gonna take one more and then I'm gonna bring the panel back in to try to address these. Yes, ma'am, right what over here. to stop Alec from mucking it up at the convention? <laughs> okay, all right, we got some good questions. I'd ask the panel to keep it very short. I'm gonna tee them up. Um, first, to Professor Chesteg, if he knows of other countries' practices, and then I'll open it, if anyone else on the panel does, to weigh in. I, I know of no other countries that has an Article 5. I mean, this is the United States Constitution. It's, it's, it's one-off, and I, I have not studied other countries. I, and I, I would be surprised to find anything remotely uh, similar to what we have here. We're, we're unique. Okay. And the question about um, the confusion here, I think, Jenk, you had a thought on yeah. that? So that's an excellent question. Um, so how many uh, calls are there for a convention and can you put them together? So that's actually uh, one of the most important questions. And before it was unsettled because uh, there was actually hundreds of calls for a convention on different issues. And so it seemed like, well, if you wanted an unlimited convention, a general convention like the 1787, you could have one. Well, uh, last couple of years has been a great clarifying moment because Congress started counting they started counting all the different convention calls. Right now they have counted up to 75 
from 36 different states. So that is enough. You need 34 states to call for a convention. The reason we don't have one is because they have decided, and by Ken is right, Amer all of these groups agree, American Bar Association, Congressional Research Service, Department of Justice, and the Senate Judiciary Committee. You cannot combine issues. If you could combine issues, we would already have one. In fact, it would be a constitutional obligation for Congress to call one. So we've settled that issue. You cannot combine them. It must be limited. OK, and then I'm going to put the last, um, maybe a slight rephrasing of the ALEC question to Vicky, um, because it may be somewhat responsive to Jenks. Because I hear in both of these some concern about on the, um, what if there's different calls? or And so what is to prevent ALEC from mucking it up? in the legal phrase, mucking it up. I like uh, once, mucking once, it up. Once the convention begins. Uh, is that a fair characterization well, I think of your it question? Is, I think yeah. it's, whether it's ALEC or any special interest group, I think we have a concern. Um, you know, we can poo-poo the rules all we want to, but the truth of the matter is we don't even know who would be at the convention. Would it be one person from Wyoming and one person from California? Is that really fair for America? Um, so we don't even know who's going to go there, how they're going to be picked. I just want to say we've been working to pass an ethics commission in New Mexico for five decades. We finally passed it last year to put it on the ballot because we don't have a ballot measure mechanism. We have to go through the state to get it on there. The number one question that people in New Mexico have about an ethics commission, they're like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Wait a minute, who the hell is going to choose who's on that commission, Vicki? Because if it's legislators or the courts or any of those people, then I'm not going to trust it. Why would this be any different at all? I, I've got to, real quick, real quick, I've got to address that. So you asked the question of uh, how do we know? So Alec has already taken over a body that can propose a, uh, an amendment, so that's really scary. It's called the United States Congress. <laughs> they already own that. So my. It, my point is that, uh, that a convention at least gives us an opportunity to get there. And, and whatever you do, do not get scared. Three quarters of the states must ratify. A convention is only to propose an amendment. Three quarters must ratify. And, we, and, and for all you progressives out there, I'm sorry, but we're not going to get a really progressive amendment. We're not going to get a really conservative amendment. We're only going to get one that an overwhelming majority of Americans agree with. And great news for us. Overwhelming majority of Americans agree on only one issue, which is to get money out of politics. So I want to thank everybody. We're out of time. Obviously, this conversation could go on much longer. But I appreciate the panel's clarity, <laughs> convictions, civil debate. It's a debate that will continue. And I thank you, everyone here, for your civil participation.